Well, good morning once again, everybody. So for like the last six months, uh, Elena and I, every morning, we start our day with uh, what we call an organic power green smoothie. Every day, last six months. So uh, some of you are already going, ooh, it doesn't sound good. Yeah, yeah. there's baby spinach and chard and, 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 and what else is in there? Uh, well, there's coconut milk and there's an apple and there's half a banana. And there's, everything's organic, flaxseed, chia seed. And also, uh, we squeeze, I squeeze an organic lemon into it, an organic lemon. So it's like an ugly lemon gets squeezed into it and every single morning. And, and I mean, I try to squeeze everything I can out of that lemon. We, we even have a utensil. To, to, you ever see one of these utensils? They're, like, uh, they're like lemon pliers or, or something like that, right? I think the technical term is lemon squeezer. And, and so you just got to get everything in and you put it through a strainer and, and all that. And that's what we're going to do today. We, we are going to squeeze everything we can out of an Old Testament story. Um, and, and, and the reason why you squeeze the lemon, because with all those other ingredients, you really don't taste the lemon, but what you want to do is you want to absorb the nutrients that's in the lemon juice, and so that's what we want to do today. We want to absorb the nutrients that we will find in this story, the nutrients that we find in the Word of God. The message is entitled today, Hope Floats. Let's pray before we study. Father, we thank you for this time in your Word. We thank you for this time in your presence. We recognize that we're not just fulfilling a religious obligation by coming to church on Sunday morning. We recognize, Lord, that we are here to meet with you, to hear from you, to worship you, to receive from you. And we know that that is only possible by the ministry and power and presence of your spirit. And so we thank you that it shall be so. In Jesus' name, amen. Open your Bibles today to 2 Kings chapter 6. If you need a Bible to study along with us, please raise your hand and Usher will bring you a Bible. 2 Kings chapter 6, it's not all that easy to find. It's on page 329 in my Bible, that is. Uh, don't be afraid to look at the table of contents if you need to. Uh, it is right after 1 Kings and that should be really helpful to you. The story takes place Approximately 800 years before Christ, 2 Kings chapter 6, we'll begin reading in verse 1, where the Bible says, And the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See now, the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan and let every man take a beam from there, and let us make there a place where we, we may dwell. So he answered, Go. Then one said, Please consent to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water, and he cried out and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. So the man of God said, Where did it fall? And he showed him the place, so he cut off a stick and threw it in there, and he made the iron float. Therefore he said, pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand and took it. At first glance, this uh, little narrative seems pretty unimportant. You know, if you miss the symbolism, you'd have to ask yourself, why is this story in the Bible? You know, a guy loses an axe head. Okay, so what? Why can't he replace it? Why can't he just go and buy another one? Uh, but that's actually the beauty of the story. That is exactly why it is included. I think far too many times we fail to take the seemingly insignificant things to God. You know, the, the, the little things that stress us and worry us and, and concern us, they seem like they're too unimportant to take to God. But then again, if they're so unimportant, why do they worry us and why do they bother us and why do they, you know, you know challenge us so much? It, it, and if they bother us, why not take them to God? You see, there are lots of little axe heads in our lives. And rather than taking them to God, you know, we often just let them sit there at the bottom of the river. Uh, oftentimes we try to figure out how we can replace them or, or what can we do to fix it. 
You see, my family, God is present with us. He is a very present help in the time of trouble. He is right there with us when the axe head slips, when it flies off the handle and it sinks to the bottom. And yes, God is, he's, he's very involved in the big issues, in all the global issues, but he is also present and engaged with us, with you and me, on a personal level, even at a minute level. You know, Jesus said, if, if your father in heaven cares for the birds of the air, how much more does he care for you? If he clothes the lilies of the field so that they're more beautiful than Solomon, what are you worrying about? Don't worry about a thing. He has every hair on your head numbered, the Bible says. And that's why Peter says you can cast all of your care on him because he cares for you. You see, you see there, there are no little you know, nice little bedtime stories in the scripture. This is not, once upon a time, a man lost his axe head. That, that's not what this is. You know, there, there, there are no superfluous narratives in the scriptures. There are no insignificant stories in the Bible because nothing in your life is insignificant to God. Every story speaks. Every story is personally applicable if you just dig a little bit. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to dig. We're going to take a look at the symbolism because this story is chock full of types and shadows. And the first one is this. The first thing I want you to note is that Jesus is the true and greater Elisha. Jesus is the true and greater Elisha. Elisha is a type and shadow of Jesus. Elisha points to Jesus. He symbolizes the Lord. And you say, well, how do we know that? There's tons of reasons. We don't even have time enough to kind of bullet point them all. But here are just a few. For example, Elisha's forerunner was Elijah. Jesus had a forerunner whose name was John the Baptist who came in the spirit and power of Elijah. Both Jesus and Elisha received the Holy Spirit at the Jordan. Both of them healed the sick, cleansed lepers, and raised the dead. Both of them miraculously fed the hungry. Both of them had a covetous disciple. Elisha had a man named Gehazi. Jesus had Judas. And we also know this, both of them defied gravity. Jesus walked on water, and here Elisha makes an iron axe head float. And both of them had their earthly lives end in a life-giving tomb. Jesus is the true and greater Elisha. Uh, the second symbol, very important, it is that the man who lost his axe head is you. The man who lost his axe head is you. Turn to the person next to you and say, he's talking to you now. Go ahead, just tell him, say, he's talking to you. He's talking to you. The man who lost his axe head is you. See, the young man in the story is a son of, of a prophet. But how many of you know that the moment you exercise personal faith in Jesus Christ, you became a son or a daughter of the greatest prophet ever, and his name is Jesus? Now watch this, because I love how the Living Bible puts this. Take a look at, at the first two verses in the Living Bible. It says, one day, the seminary students came to Elisha and told him, as you can see, our dormitory is too small. Tell us, as our president, whether we can build a new one down beside the Jordan where there are plenty of logs. <laughs> now, the son of the prophets, they were an amazing group of young men. They were called. They were chosen. They, they had a holy lineage. But how many of you know, so do you. So do you. How many of you know you have the DNA of the Trinity in you? You're called, you're chosen, you're gifted, you're, you're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, you're a king and a priest unto your God, you're an ambassador for Christ. Now the sons of the prophets, they were hungry for God. They, they were advancing in their faith. They wanted to know more. They wanted to fulfill their purpose. They wanted to become all that they could become. They wanted to do all that God had destined them to do. They didn't want to miss out. They, they weren't okay with, with spiritual lethargy or complacency. They, they wanted to maximize their effectiveness. They wanted to experience new dimensions of trust. They wanted to discover new depths of life and joy, mature in their faith, develop and grow. They were pressing toward the mark of the upward call of God. And listen carefully, I am fully convinced that that's why you're here today. Yeah. Yeah. I'm convinced that that's you. I, that's why you come to Turning Point. 
Regardless of gender, I believe you are one of the sons of the prophets, and today you're in the school of the prophets. Listen, by the grace of God, I don't know if you've noticed this, that's who Turning Point attracts. That's who we attract, people who don't want to be complacent because you will not last very long here if you want to stay the same. If you don't want to grow or you want somebody else to do your growth for you, this is, this is what we do. This is who we are. Change lives, period. Say that with me today. Change lives, period. Say it louder. Change lives, period. That's our mission. So if you come here spiritually complacent, listen, you will either experience a moment with God where he just shakes that out of you, where the Holy Spirit lights a fire underneath you, or you'll say, wait a second, this is too intense, this is too radical, I'm okay with mediocrity, I'm going to just, you know, I'm good with boring religion, I'm just going to let my axe head lay at the bottom of the river, thank you very much. It's like the young preacher who was given his first Assignment. He was given his first congregation, you know, a little congregation deep in the, in the backwoods of the deep south. And, and he went in there for his very first Sunday and he stood up before that little congregation and he said, you know, this, this, this congregation is going to rise up and walk. And they said, let it walk, preacher. Let it walk. He said, we're not just going to walk. We're going to Run and not get weary. And they said, amen. (laughs) We're going to run. Let it run, preacher. Let it run. He said, we're not just going to walk. We're not just going to run. We're going to mount up with wings like eagles. And we're going to soar. And they started to stand up and said, let it soar. Let it soar. And he said, and if we're going to soar, it's going to take money. And they said, let it walk. Let it walk. Let it walk. Turning point is where you come to get your wings, by the way. This is flight school, you know, so you can take off and soar. And that's who the sons of the prophets were. They, 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 they were in training for reigning. And, and so are you. That's why you're here. You, you may have been called the son of a gun, but you are a son of a prophet. Amen. And, and notice also that the sons of the prophets, they're involved, man. They're involved. They're not just sitting back like spectators. They're involved, man. There's an ax in their hand, right? There are people of vision. There are people of action. They're, they're like, let's go. The place that we've got is too small. Let's get a hand to the plow. Everyone pulling in the same direction. Get out your ax. Let's advance. Let's serve. Yes, let's study. Let's pray. Let's sing. Let's worship. And let's work. We'll serve one another in love. You, know, you be a greeter, you be an usher, you do the sound, you do the lights, you get out your axe, I mean your guitar, and lead the music, and, and you do children's ministry, and you serve the teens. Let's go, everyone on board, all hands on deck, we're, we're, we're growing, no room for spectators, everyone on the field. Because everyone has a gift, and everyone has a talent, and everyone has been equipped, so now let's serve. And they're saying, and you know what? We'll do it in community. We'll do it in community. The sons of the prophets are, yes, again, enrolled in the school of the prophets. And that's what this was. This was the perfect picture of community, of agreement, of togetherness, of what what the book of Acts calls koinonia. That's community, a plurality of oneness, a celebration of unified diversity. Doing life together, praying together, studying together, growing together. And, and, and let me just push the pause button for just a moment. That is why it is so important that when we roll out the next semester of community groups, which will happen on September 10th, it is so important that everyone get into a community group to do life together, to pray together, to share with one another. Yes, this is a shameless promo for, yeah, a shameless plug. But listen, I really mean it. It's so important for us to have that. So back to the text. Because next, something happens to one of them. One of them, now again, he's like all the rest, right? He's a young man who is advancing, he's growing, he wants to know God more. He's someone who's dedicated, he's someone who loves the Lord. But something happens, something personal happens. Something falls, something slips. You know, b- before we lived in Texas, we lived in Connecticut. And when we moved to Connecticut, we moved to Connecticut from Florida. And so when we went to Connecticut, we had a couple surprises. 
First of all, we did not budget for heating oil. Oh, yeah. In Connecticut, that's how you heat your house, with heating oil. They actually pull a truck right up on your driveway and take a hose out, and there's a receptacle in the wall of your house that they just plug it in, and they just pump thousands of gallons of oil into your basement tank. And then they bill you for it. And it's thousands of dollars a year. We were not ready for that. The other thing that kind of surprised us, uh, the, the owner, when he was leaving, he said, hey, listen, I left you a bunch of, of firewood in the back. And it was. It was a massive pile of logs in the back. He put a tarp over it. It never got wet. I was like, awesome. The first hint of, of, of chill in the air, which is uh, mid-August in Connecticut. You know, and my wife's like, man, build a fire. I'm like, yeah, let's go build a fire. I never really built a fire before. So I go, I go to the back, and I get the logs. You know, I bring the logs in, and I fit the logs in the fire fireplace and, 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 and light it, kind of. Try to light it. <laughs> Newspaper, sticks, and nothing's catching. Until it dawns on me, you can't just stick a whole log in the fire. You have to split the logs for fire to happen. And so... So I put on my work boots and my, and, and my flannel shirt, because that's the uniform, right? That when you go to split logs, right? Right? I put on the flannel shirt, you know? And, and, the, and the owner left, a, uh, he left an axe for me in the basement, a real a big axe with a big wooden handle. And so I got it out there and whack, you know, and it's, it's, the first few are a lot of fun, you know, whack, and it's splitting, and you're like, man, I can do this, whack, and then, you know, after about 10, your heart's going, da -da -dung, da -da -dung, da -da -dung. get somebody else to do this, but anyway, and so, and so, something, though, happened that day that if you've ever swung an axe for an extended period of time, can happen, maybe it's happened to you, the axe head starts to get a little jiggly, it starts to get a little loose from the wooden handle. And when that happens, you better pay attention. Because if that goes without adjustment, what can happen is either direction, or, and if that axe head hits somebody, it could be really bad. That's what happens to this young man. That's exactly what happens to this seminary student. The axe head slips off the handle. He was making progress, right? He was, he was part of the team. He was part of the body. He was advancing in community. And then he let something slip. He became inattentive to something relatively small. He didn't check the axe head. He didn't pay attention to detail. The Bible tells us Solomon said, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Eh, now this wasn't intentional. It wasn't malicious. It was a mistake. It was a slip up. The, the axe head, the Bible says, fell. It, it wasn't planned. It wasn't premeditated. It was just something he let slip away by being inattentive to detail, forgetting to do something, though small, that was important. Not being diligent in little things caused him to lose his cutting edge. And I'm not just trying to make a play on words there, although, although this is a colloquialism that we use a lot, right? We say things like, you know, we, we say that someone's either sharp or dull. You know, she doesn't make the cut. He doesn't make the cut. He, he doesn't cut it. He's not really the sharpest knife in the drawer or the sharpest tool in the shed. We, we say things like, or, or we say, you know what? She is on the cutting edge of that research. Or, or, yeah, he's a really sharp guy. This young man lost his cutting edge. In essence, his ability to produce became dull. He couldn't make any further progress. He... he you could say he got stuck because he let a detail slip. He got a little careless. And how many of you know that happens to the best of us? Right? No one's perfect. 
Everyone occasionally has an unintended slip up. Everyone makes mistakes. We, we all, every now and then, prove just how human we really are. And that's why everyone in this room is this guy. And think about it. It wouldn't, it, it wouldn't have been nearly as bad if that axe head came off the handle and flew into the bushes somewhere. Right, where he could just go and get it, where he could just go and reach out and grab it again. But the axe head fell into the river. It fell into the Jordan River. And this is another important detail that actually makes the miracle even more miraculous if that's possible. But where this took place, alongside the Jordan, you can find out where this happened. It's pretty easy to plot on a map where this actually took place and if you put a pin in this spot in the Jordan, can I just tell you something? At this place in the Jordan, for a long stretch, the Jordan is anything but clear. It's murky. It's, it's muddy. It's brown. This is not where you'd want to be baptized in the Jordan. All right? You'd go down clean and, and come up dirty, which is kind of the opposite of, of baptism, right? Right? The axe head, his cutting edge, goes down into the muck and the mire. It goes beyond his reach. He can't even see it anymore. Now, believe it or not, muddy waters, muck and mire, are symbolic in Scripture. Probably just the way you think they are. Matter of fact, take a look at Psalm 40, verses 1 and 2 in the New Living Translation. Let's read this aloud together. Ready? Everybody, let's read it. I waited patiently for the Lord to help me, and he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along muddy waters. Muck and mire are metaphors for despair. And you, you can hear it in this young man's voice, can't you? You know, he loses the, the accent. And you can hear the anguish. Alas, master! Sometimes what began as being inattentive, a little carelessness, winds up going down deep into despair. You were inattentive in your marriage, and it went down. It got all muddied up. And you find yourself in despair. You didn't pay attention to detail in your business. And, and mistakes happened. And sales went down. And profits went down. And you couldn't fix it. Mistakes were made. And now you're stuck in the mud. You got careless with kindness. You got careless with compassion. You got careless with caring. And it's not lost in the bushes. Where, where you could just reach it. Where you could just fix it in the muck and the mire of despair. Or maybe you used to be careful with your words, but, but lately you've been letting that slip. You're not being malicious. You're just, you know, you just started exaggerating. You just, you know, you're, you're fudging the truth a little bit. You just wanted to smooth things over, so you, you lied. Or, 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 or maybe you didn't think that, you know... Uh, Gossip was a big deal. You, you, you told yourself you were just sharing with other people so they could pray. It's not a big thing per se, ex except that it is. Maybe you've become more glib or more sarcastic. You didn't used to be like that. You weren't okay with occasional profanity. You didn't used to tell off-color jokes. But you've let it slip. And you lost your cutting edge. You short-circuited the creative power of your tongue to speak life and to speak health and to speak with the authority of Jesus' name. You lost your confidence. You lost your credibility. Your integrity in the eyes of others has become dulled. It's become muddied. You let your tongue get polluted, and so its power has become diluted. So there's a dullness about you. you could, there's a dullness in your eyes. It's a dullness about your spiritual advancement, your maturity, your growth. You're, you're, you're just not mowing down trees the way you used to. You're not seeking the Lord the way you used to. 
Now, now, now listen, that means it is time to be courageous enough to ask yourself the hard question. What have you let slip? What have you been inattentive to detail concerning? What in your walk with the Lord have you become careless with? Now listen, there is no condemnation in in the asking or the answering of those questions. There is conviction, yes, but condemnation never. If you've become inattentive, it doesn't mean you're a bad person because you're not. Actually, by the grace of God, you're a good person. You're someone who wants to grow. You you, you want to know God more. You you want to to see your full potential in God realized. Yes, it's why you're here, but you know that something has slipped. And we're going to go out of chronological order here in the story for just a moment because we can't miss this. To get on the solution side, to, 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 to become spiritually sharp again, to recover your cutting edge, to get it back, you have to go back. Say that with me today. To get it back, you have to go back. Everybody a little bit louder. To get it back, you have to go back. Listen, to recover, you have to return. So the man of God said, where did it fall? And he showed him the place. Where did you let it slip? Where did you stop paying attention to little things? Where did it become okay for you to not be diligent? Where did it fall? You know what this is? This is God saying, son, daughter, remember and repent. It's like when the the resurrected and glorified Christ in Revelation says the following. He says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. Remember where you lost it, where it went down. And now look at it differently than the way you looked at it then. Repent. Again, every time we say the word repent, we've got to make sure you understand what repentance, biblical scriptural repentance is. It is not not falling on the floor, crying your eyes out, blowing snot all over yourself. Okay, it may include those things. That may happen. But that is not what repentance is. Repentance is metanoia, Meta, in Greek, metanoia, meta change, noia mind. Change your mind. Change your mind about your complacency. Change your mind about your carelessness. Change your mind about being inconsiderate. Change your mind concerning being so self absorbed. Change your perspective. See it for what it really is. See it for what it causes you and causes those around you. Because that's not who you are. You are bigger than that, and by the grace of God, you are better than that. Now go back and and, and own it, the Lord is saying. He's saying, go back and own it, and I will be with you. When you do, I'll be with you. I, I will not leave you. You will not have to do this alone. I am with you always. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Listen, no strings attached, no fine print, no addendum. On your worst moment, on your worst day, you are just as loved by God the Father as Jesus was and is. God is saying, listen, when I told you I would go with you, I didn't just say I'll go with you in the good times. Nothing can separate you from my love. So go back, go back. Show me where the axe head flew off into the murky river. Show me where it all got murky, where it went out of reach, where you couldn't get it back for yourself, where you couldn't fix it. And let me do for you what you cannot do for yourself. (laughs) Let me recover for you what you could not recover for yourself. Let me restore your cutting edge. Let me delete your despair. Let me make your hope float. Now notice, what's the first thing this prophet in training says when he loses the ax head? He says, alas, master, for it was borrowed. Say that with me. Alas, master, for it was borrowed. (laughs) That is a brilliant statement. This is the first step in recovering what has been lost. This is really the first step in any sort of recovery. 
The first step in seeing your hope float again is humility. It's humility. In humility, don't run from God, run to God. Now, now this kid could have just engaged in fake it till you make it, right? He could have just started, fake it till you make it. He could have done that. He could have just looked around, made sure that no one else saw his axe head fly off into the river and just acted like it didn't and just kept the handle with him and just walked up to the next tree and just start beating the tree with an axe handle, <laughs> looking at the other guys going, yeah, yeah, right? He's making the same motions. He's got the same sweat going on, just... But there'll be no results. See, he's just going to go through, he could just go through the motions, but all the while he knows there'll be no results. Because you've lost the thing that made you efficient and effective. But he doesn't. He doesn't just go through the motions, he humbles himself. It wasn't mine, it was borrowed. It belongs to somebody else. It was a beautiful axe. It was sharp. It was shiny, but it wasn't mine. My family, everything we have is on loan from God. Everything we have is on loan from God. Your, your family is on loan from God. Your friends are on loan from God. Your finances are on loan from God. And I know some, no, my, it, it was my blood, sweat, and tears that got me my money. Really? Who gave you the blood, the sweat, and the tears? Oh, I'm a self-made man. You made yourself? Dude, that's awesome. <laughs> your health is borrowed. Your time is borrowed. Your abilities, your talents, your skills, your connections, your opportunities, your intellect, your very next breath are on loan from God. The Bible says every good and perfect gift is from above, from the Father of lights, in whom there is neither variableness nor shadow of turning. Jesus said, everything you have, you have received. Yeah. Alas, master, for it was borrowed. It, it, it is saying, I, I can do nothing without you. I am nothing apart from you. Now, I am thankful that I am not apart from you, but... I am what I am by the grace of God. It is saying, I am what I am by unmerited favor. Everything I have is yours. Everything I am is yours. Everything I ever will be is yours. I am not my own. I've been bought with a price. I cannot take the credit for my former advancement. I cannot take the credit for what made me sharp, for, for the progress, for the success, for the achievements, for the accomplishments, for the accolades, for the awards, for the creativity, for the ideas, for the favor, for being in the right place at the right time. I cannot take credit for any of it. To God be the glory. Amen. It was all your grace. It was all your mercy. It was all your doing. Anything and everything good in me or, or that happens through me or that happens for me, it's because of you and you alone, Jesus. Alas, Master, it was borrowed. See, the first step in seeing your hope float again is humility. Humility. So the young man shows Elisha where the lost axe head, you know, where he lost the axe head. He shows him the general area of the river in which he, he lost it in. What happened next? So he cut off a stick and threw it in there, and he made the iron float. Okay, now the word in Hebrew for cut off would have been better translated as fashioned. He fashioned something. He didn't just snip off a stick and throw it in. That's not what happened. He fashioned something from the tree. Uh, what almost all the commentators agree on is what Elisha did at this point was he cut something from the tree and he fashioned the young man a new axe handle. New axe handle. And it makes sense. The, the old one was the reason why he lost the axe head in the first place. The old axe handle wouldn't do anymore. All things had to be made new. How many of you know you can't use what lost your cutting edge in the first place to try to keep it the second time around? You can't do the same things over and over and over again and expect different results. You can't keep being inattentive and careless and expect to make progress. You need a new handle on things. 
You see, God doesn't just restore what you lost. He gives you the capacity to keep it. Mm. What did Paul tell Timothy? He told him this. He said, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep, that he is able to keep, that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Listen, my family, the blood that bought you can keep you. The grace that saved you will sanctify you. And the Savior who pulled you up out of the miry clay sets your feet upon a rock. He is a God who makes all things new. He'll give you fresh wisdom. He will surround you with the right people, people who are pulling in the same direction, people of vision, people who have the same heart, who want to grow in God. You see, God will show you how to not just get good things, but how to keep them, how to have your marriage renewed. How to have an ever-growing personal relationship with God. And when God restores, it is never to the place where you lost it before. Listen carefully. Search the scriptures. Every time God restores, if you were here and things went south and something slipped and something fell, when God restores, he never restores here. God always restores here. Every single time in the Bible. Every time. He restores here. But not only that, it's not just so that you can have it. It's so that you can keep it. Listen, when I was 20 years old, I had become dull. Dull. I lost any semblance of sharpness. Yeah, I I didn't, I didn't just, it wasn't because I lost an ax head. It was because I lost billions of brain cells. Yeah, through drugs and alcohol. Sure. Man, I fried my brain at the age of 20. I, I, I couldn't make a good decision for the life of me. I, I couldn't make a good choice. And, and that spiraled me into despair. But when I came to the Lord on Easter Sunday, 1984, can I just tell you something? Wham. Clarity. Restoration. My mental faculties, my intellect, my my soul was restored. My mind began to to start becoming renewed. Listen carefully. I I, I, I not only got my axe head restored, I got my actual head restored. (laughs) See, when God restores, he gives you the tools you need to hold on to what he gives you. That's how comprehensively good God is. So he gives the kid a new handle and he fashions it from the tree. But now, why didn't Elisha just command the axe head to come out of the water and to fly over like a drone kind of thing, like one of those spinner things, and come over and just get on the old axe, axe handle? Why didn't he just, I mean, if you could command an, axe, uh, uh, an iron axe head to float, you can command it to fly, right? So why didn't that happen? I'll give you two reasons. First, because the wood fashioned from the tree had to go into the water. Let me say it again. Because the wood fashioned from the tree had to go into the water. I told you this story is just overflowing with symbolism. Watch this. That tree had to go into the water. It had to go into the muddy river. The wood had to be placed into the muck and mire of despair. Just like the branch that had to be placed in the bitter waters of Marah by Moses so that the bitter waters could be turned into sweet. Listen, the healing of bitterness happened because a tree was placed in the water just like the fiery serpent in the wilderness had to be placed on a wooden pole so that when it was raised up, the snake-bitten children of Israel could be healed. And listen carefully. What? Listen carefully. What, Jesus said this. He said, when Moses lifted up that fiery serpent on a wooden pole in the wilderness. Jesus said in the gospel of John, that was me. That was me. I will become sin when I'm placed on the wood and when I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Follow me here. Jesus is saying, I am the branch that heals bitterness. 
And my family, when Elijah takes the wood fashioned from a tree and puts it into the muddy waters, it is a sign, it is a symbol, it is a type, it is a shadow that the only way despair is forever deleted, the only way that hope comes back to the surface, the only way that what we let slip away is miraculously restored is because of what happened on that tree on Calvary. A savior on a cross fashioned from a tree took our despair. When he sweat great drops of blood, when he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death, when he said, Father, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Listen to me. He was plunged into the river. He was immersed into the muck and the mire. He went into the darkness. He absorbed the fallenness. He got himself dirty in the river of our distress. And because he allowed himself to be plunged into the darkness... When he rose from it, so did our hope, and so did our dreams, and so did our recovery, and so did our freedom, and so do our relationships, and so did our purpose. Put the tree in the water. Apply what Jesus Christ did on Calvary's tree to your loss, to your slip-ups, to your inadvertent inattentiveness. Hear, meditate on, reflect on the Father. Forgive them for they know not what they do. Let the it is finished wash over you. Dwell on the debt is paid in full. And when you do, let hope arise. Let hope float. Let a confident expectation of good be restored to your soul. Nothing is impossible for God. I mean, think about this story. An iron axe head floats. Our God does that stuff. And if he does that stuff, he can surely restore whatever you have lost. So the first reason why the axe head floats was because the tree had to be placed in the water, but the second and the final reason was to teach us, ready, that you got to take it. You got to take it. Oh, turn to the person next to you and say, you got to take it. Go ahead, tell them. That was just, that was pathetic, guys. It's like, you got to take it. You got to take it. And now we're just going to, you're going to get a do-over. Grace, right? Listen, listen, listen. You're going to get a do-over. So I want you to do it with a little drama. Matter of fact, I think it would be helpful to, to actually point your finger a little bit, not too much, not kind of a soft point, and shake it at him a little bit and say, say, you got to take it. Go ahead, tell him. Say, you got to take it. You got to take it. You got to take it. Put a little scowl on your face. Say, you got to take it. What's the last thing that Elisha, who is a type and shadow of Jesus, says to the young man who is a type and shadow of us, He says, therefore, he said, pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand and took it. My family never forget what God gives by grace we must take by faith. That's your part. The just shall live by his faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. This is where you trust that God's love is way bigger than whatever your lost axe head is. This is where you believe that God's ability is bigger than anything that has been done to you. This is where you rely on God's promises being far more powerful than than any of your problems. And you start to, you see it. You see it. You see it with the eyes of faith. You see the axe head float. And you get into the river, you step into the flow, and you grab it by faith. 
This is where you see with your inner eyes. You see the unseen. You see the impossibility suddenly as possible. You, but why? Because you see that because the tree was plunged into the water because of what Jesus Christ did for you on the wood that now you've been given all things that pertain to life and godliness because of what he did on Calvary. You are now blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places because of what he did on that wood that was fashioned from tree. Listen carefully now. You're the head and not the tail. You're above only and never beneath. You are your beloved's and he is yours. (laughs) And it's all there. It's all been provided for. Not by what you do, but because of what he did. It's already yours. Man, the answer was with you before you ever had a problem. It's there for the taking. You have the title deed for everything you'll ever need. You're you're an heir of all things, the Bible says. It's all been deposited into your account. It's all floated to the top for you. Now take it. Reach out and grab it by faith. You know, there's that obscure verse in Exodus that says if you lose anything, if anything is ever stolen from you, you go to to Elohim and you say, this is mine. That's what this is, saying, I lost something. Something, I let something slip, inattentive to detail, and I lost my cutting edge, and I lost that thing that caused me to advance, and I lost that thing that caused me to grow. I've grown dull, but this is mine. And you take it. Joy is yours, peace is yours, wisdom is yours, new beginnings are yours, renewal is yours, refreshing is yours, reconciliation is yours, restoration is yours. Now reach out and pick it up for yourself. Man, reach out in a spirit of faith and take it. Alas, master, it was borrowed. So you assume a posture of humility. Own where you lost it and see it the way God sees it. Apply the finished work of Jesus to anything that causes despair and reach out in faith and receive what only God can restore.